the, old, the first one was Crystal Springs. We, we refer to it as Old Crystal Springs today. And then San Andreas Dam, which is closer to the city and higher in elevation. And it was built in 1868 and to 1870, also as a, a clay puddled core, uh, which is a hydraulic fill type. And uh, in 1906 earthquake, uh, it actually cut right through the abutment between two embankment sections of the dam. And the peak ground acceleration in that event was about 0.7 G. And it was, uh, they did a lot of learning on that one. If we actually, um, so I don't, I didn't include it in here, but it actually severed the outlet works, which was a brick lined conduit that was seven feet in diameter. It actually moved that about six feet and chopped it off, but the lake retained its water. Uh, and so it was built in two, three sections, 1868 to 1870 and the white here, the stippled is the 1875 raising of it. And then the last raising, 1928 up here on the top. Um, Bowman Dam, 1875, was uh, the second rock fill dam in the state. And that was to supply water for hydraulic mining. And of course, the rivers that were the most impacted by hydraulic mining were the Yuba, the Bear, um, and the American rivers. And this uh, upstream face was constructed with, a, with cribs and rock filled cribs and was very, very steep, 45 degrees and then 60 degrees on the back. We wouldn't dream of doing something uh, with those kind of steepnesses today, but it was originally 86 feet high right to here. And then it was heightened to 107 feet. And when they heightened it to 107, it was the highest dam in the world between 1880 and 1888. And California has more uh, national and world records in dam building than any other state in the union, as we're gonna find out today. This one was dismantled in 1926, and a larger rock fill was built here by Bechtel. That was for Pacific Gas and Electric generate electricity. That's how PG&E got into the electricity business, was basically originally, these were uh, waterworks that were designed to develop um, electricity for mining purposes. The world's first arch dam was Bear Valley Dam, which we now know as Big Bear, uh, in uh, the San Bernardino Mountains above San Bernardino. And this was a very daring design at the time by Frank E. Brown, who was president of ASCE in the 1880s. It formed Big Bear Lake. They called it Bear Valley Dam. That's what it looked like. And this actually shows how thin this thing is. A lot of people predicted that it would never work, especially in an area that had earthquakes, because we're not that far from the San Andreas Fault where this thing is built. And uh, it uh, never had an earthquake, uh, design level earthquake, like a MAG 7-7, anything like that. that. That occurred in January 1857, long before this was built um, in 1883. But the dam did work and it was replaced by this buttress dam designed by John S. Eastwood. And he did um, a number of these kinds of um, buttress dams in California in the early 1900s. This is a postcard when we went up there to visit when I was a kid in the early 60s. And that's the Eastwood Dam. They put a a uh, vehicle viaduct over it in the 1930s. The dam was built in 1916. And this is, this, when the water was down lower below spillway, there's the old 1883 dam right there. And people would walk out on that and go fishing from it. And they actually reduced it by a height of about eight feet so that water could get over it and go over the spillways without being interrupted. So this was called the Rim of the, high, rim of the World Highway that was built in 1926. Um, Lower Crystal Springs Dam, uh, which is down near San Carlos, uh, right along the San Andreas Fault. It's only a couple hundred meters off the active trace of the fault. It was the first mass concrete dam in the world. It was designed by Herman Schussler, uh, who was chief engineer of the Spring Valley Water Company of San Francisco. There wasn't any suitable rock at the site, so 
they built this mass concrete dam. In 2009, 2012, it was retrofitted and heightened. You see right here, these walls. And it was a very important structure because Schuessler recognized that concrete shrinks about half a percent as it cures. And so he built this interconnecting system of blocks where he'd allow it to have the concrete heat of hydration and shrink some before he put the next level in and so on and so forth. So he never, he never got it all the way to the top where he wanted to, they ran out of money. And that's a common problem in California history as well, as we're gonna see. So the dam got up to here, upper left, and it didn't get up to the full height till 2012. And now it does have the full height. It was there in the 1906 earthquake, and uh, that earthquake was right over here, and it offset Old Crystal Springs Dam, which is underneath the lake. We're gonna look at it here in a minute, and um, it did not damage this dam. So in the 1970s, after the um, San Fernando earthquake in 1971, the state tightened up all the earthquake loading design uh, numbers and they had every dam looked at, all, especially all of the hydraulic fill dams. And they came out and did a reassessment of this. Waller Associates did it. And I was part of that team from Cal Berkeley that went out here and drilled holes into the foundation rock and put a Goodman Jack into those holes. And we lost the original Goodman Jack. It turned out that the rock was so fractured it attenuated that earthquake energy in 1906. And so uh, it was actually the dam is a very conservative section, as you can see here, and it was a good match for the rock at that site just by blind luck. Um, you can see this is the timber roadway going across the unfinished crest. That was the way that it was finished down here at this lower height of about 154 feet. The design height was originally 170. Um, this actually shows the interconnected blocks and how Schussler paid attention to detail and he had these men come in here and brush off the latent layer above each block so that he waited 30 days between the laying of a block till he had the next one. The Portland cement for this project back in the 1880s um, had to be brought in from England. Didn't that, we weren't actually producing enough of it in the United States. It was they used one barrel of Portland cement, two barrels of sand, two thirds of a barrel of water, and 22 cubic feet of crushed stone. And that made each cubic yard of concrete weigh about 470 pounds. That's pretty good concrete by anybody's standards, even today. And remember, they were not doing mechanical um, vibration here. This is all hand vibrated uh, using um, uh, iron rakes and they got a very, very good result with it. This actually shows the dam being overtopped in 1890 during its final construction. Of course, being a mass concrete dam, it could survive overtopping without too much trouble. Sweetwater Dam is a, a storied structure. It's down in San Diego County, south of uh, San Diego. It's part of a, a land uh, real estate scheme as most of the dams down there were in the early days. It was designed by a guy named Uncle Jimmy, James D. Schuler, in 1886 for the San Diego Land and Town Company. And it was a cyclopean masonry, which means they're quarrying sandstone blocks or granite, has a lot of granite blocks. And then they're um, putting mortar between them to make a, um, a rock mortar dam. We call that cyclopean masonry. All the early dams were generally of that type. Original height was 90 feet. The crest length was 380 feet. The big question a lot of people had for Schuler was, is this waste weir, the spillway, large enough for the kind of watershed he had behind this, which was sizable? So um, he thought it was, and there was quite a bit of debate about it at the October 1888 ASCE National Meeting that's recorded in the ASCE transactions and you can see here, these are the flash boards they could put in there to pull the water up. And when you have a big flood come through, you pull those boards out to increase the bypass amount. The tributary drainage area on this thing 
was 182 square miles. In California, that's a pretty big number because we, we don't have a lot of really large watersheds. Um, Schuler responded that the capacity was based on his back analysis of the 1884 flood in Sweetwater Creek. Um, that was a big deal, folks. I mean, January, February, 1884, every railroad bridge between Santa Fe, New Mexico and Santa Barbara, California failed in the flood. On the Colorado River at Needles, that flood got up to 383,000 cubic feet per second. The low flow in January 1911 was 500 cubic feet per second. That's a difference of 763 to one, which is the highest variance of any river that we have documented in the continental United States. So he thought this thing was adequate because it had gotten through the 1884 flood and that was a very serious event and nobody questioned it until 1902 when the watershed was subjected to six inches of rainfall in 24 hours, which is a lot in San Diego County. And it uh, overtopped 7,200 CFS cubic feet per second, was overtopped for 40 hours to a depth of 22 inches, which you see over here. It didn't take off the uh, handrail grating on the top of it. Um, the outlet works were essentially destroyed down here, but the dam, actually survived it um, pretty well. Hemet Dam was also designed by Jimmy Schuler, and it was on the south fork of the San Jacinto River up, up above Hemet, and it was designed to store water for the citrus orchards that were then being uh, planted in central Riverside County. It was another dam project where they ran out of money. Up to right, you see here, there was the original height of the dam, very, very large. Um, going to be 160 plus feet high, and they got up to 122, and they stopped. And there's what it looked like where they stopped. And these are people walking along. It's a colorized postcard that I bought as a kid in Hemet, 1965. And there's the plan view of the dam. And it was very interesting. It was a cyclopean masonry, so it's lots and lots of rock. And... Um, concrete mortar with sand and it was completed, it was, construction was halted in 1895. They used 20,000 barrels of cement in its construction. And um, they had this concrete arc section that they added on right here at the top, which increased their storage significantly, but it was halted 40 feet below where its design crest was. So it's a pretty conservative section. It's on bedrock, which is the good news in California, uh, because you're gonna get less um, peak ground acceleration if you're on bedrock, always. This is Lower Ote, it was the highest rock fill dam in the world uh, in 1897. It was also uh, not designed by an engineer, designed by a land developer named E.S. Babcock, and it was the highest rock fill dam until 1914. Um, what Babcock did is he put a half inch steel plate as the cutoff wall all the way down through the center of the section. And you can see his slopes here are one and a half to one or about 33.6 degrees. And the rubble rock fill was placed in here. It was not mechanically compacted, nor was it sluiced. Because in those days, they usually sluiced it with jet, water jets. And that was actually a pretty good technique um, if you had different size material to get the material to pack down for rock fill. The daily leakage on this dam, going underneath it mostly and around it on the abutments, was between 225,000 and 400,000 gallons per day. This was a, a, a very normal problem in the early days of dam engineering in California, between 1880 and the 19- 20s, they had lots of dams that leaked like sieves, generally. Um, there's the San Andreas Tunnel. I wanted to show this, I had it put later because this is, this is the damage that occurred in 1906. So here you can see, here's the main embankment on the upper left, and then there's this saddle in here, which is a shutter ridge along the fault. So there is the active San Andreas Fault in the shutter ridge, and there's a little saddle dam next to it, and the outlet works went right down this shutter ridge. So right here, 
it got gnarled and it got offset by the right lateral offset of the fault. And the fault rupture right here was about seven feet. So it was a circular conduit. You can see it's four layers of brick lining and it was completely crunched. It wasn't cut off completely uh, and water did leak through it without having a failure, which was a real godsend uh, in the end. But it did survive uh, the big quake. This is uh, old Crystal Springs Dam, which was underneath water behind new Crystal Springs Dam when the earthquake occurred. They didn't get to take a look at this till 25 years later when the water was at a low stage. And when they did that, they saw that it was actually offset by seven feet. That's similar to the same offset over here a few miles up the valley at San Andreas Dam. So this is a, an old earth fill dam and it actually offset and did not have any kind of rupture to it. And so it was one of the observations that engineers started making was that earthen dams, especially with plastic soils like clay in them, uh, can take earthquake movements uh, better than more brittle masonry dams. At least that was the, the, the suggestion and the assumption when I was going to grad school in the 1970s. Um, lots of rock fill dams, which were built uh, in Southern California and in the Sierra foothills, leaked so badly that they had to be abandoned. Those included the Chatsworth Park Dam, shown here on the left in the San Fernando Valley, and the Escondido Dam down near Escondido in Southern in California in San Diego County. And here the, uh, they put boards up the back because the boards would swell together and give them more of an impervious face against the rock. And they got it at 60 degrees on the upstream side. As soon as the lake would get up to this level right here, which is just about halfway to the design height, it started leaking 100,000 gallons per day. And so they ended up uh, tearing this down and replacing it with the present dam they have there uh, in the mid-1920s. This is Morena Dam, and it's a very famous one. It was built in the 1890s, and the reason is because it had a very deep cutoff wall and a slot canyon down here, cut into solid granite of the Southern California batholith. It had a very steep up Sl uh, upstream slope on the back, again with um, reinforced concrete now instead of the planks. And uh, it was built between 1896 and 1911. That's a you know, 15 year period. It was designed by Michael O'Shaughnessy, who went on to become the chief engineer of the San Francisco Department of Public Works in the 19 teens and 20. Uh, O'Shaughnessy was a uh, native of Ireland and got his uh, education there and then uh, cut his teeth actually doing waterworks projects in Hawaii. He was the first engineer to do uh, water supply tunnels and dams, both on Maui and on Kauai and some on uh, Oahu and Hawaii, mostly for pineapple and sugarcane. And then he came back to the continental United States and started doing these kinds of jobs. He had a lot of tunneling expertise that he had gained in, in Hawaii. And this had the deepest dam foundation in the world at the time it was, um, it was completed. Um, Hubert Green, who was the other designer, battled with his construction foreman to place high quality concrete. And uh, the leakage here varied between 33,600 and 58,000 gallons per day, always depending on the head. And so it was heightened in 1920 to a height of 177 feet. This is actually seeing these stiff leg derricks that the Romans use and that everybody else used right up through World War II for picking up heavy things like blocks, they call her, uh, and plumb blocks and setting those in on the upstream face. This is the downstream face, which is rubble fill, been dumped off side dumping rail cars. Um, this is San Fernando Dam and Reservoir. While it was under construction up here as a hydraulic fill with a puddled core, that was very typical of what LA Department, actually it was the Bureau of Waterworks and Supply in those days. They didn't conjoin 
the power division and the water division until 1931. Um, this was built in 1911, 1917 as the largest storage dam in the city area. And there's a, later they built an upper Van Norman Reservoir, and this is the lower Van Norman Reservoir. And you can see it had a, a concrete facing here on the upstream face as originally built. This shows it in 1920. It was raised in 1924-25, and that's when they renamed it Lower Van Norman Reservoir after Harvey Van Norman, who, who succeeded William Mulholland as the chief engineer and general manager of LADWP in uh, late 1929. Um, 1915, we get the first dam safety legislation because we had a big flood that hit the southern coast area in January 1914 and a lot of dams down in San Diego County uh, failed and a lot of some people were killed. So in 1915, the state legislature passes the first um, dam safety law and they said uh, all plans for dams and reservoirs have to be submitted to the state engineer for approval. And then they had a two year study that was done with this legislation and in August 1916, the state reclamation board issued a report recommending that the state engineer regulate all storage reservoirs. And no further action was taken on the legislature until after they had another 100 year storm in January, 1916. Now just in case you like statistics, California is a great place to play with statistics because in the 20th century, uh, they had seven to nine 100 year storms. That's really hard to do because you're only supposed to have one. Um, to know what a 100-year storm is, of course, depends on the duration. There's a 24-hour storm, a 72-hour, a seven-day, a 30-day, an annual. Now, those are all 100-year events. It just means it has a 1% probability of occurrence. But to know the 1% probability of occurrence, you'd have to have 1,000 years of record, and we don't. We, have, we go back to the gold rush. Uh, we have about 160 years of record, so there's a lot of postulating that has to go on. Um, the early 1916 flood actually took out the right abutment of Sweetwater Dam. Remember Sweetwater Dam? Well, Jimmy Shuler didn't live to see this. He died um, back around 1911. And um, after he had prepared a plan that raised this dam 15 feet and uh, the dam got overtopped by a depth of almost four feet in 1916, and notice, this is the problem in California, you're on a, an active tectonic margin, and the, what the dams are made out of isn't nearly as much of a problem as what the abutments are made out of. Most of the failures in California have been the abutment or foundation materials have been what was at uh, risk, much more so than the part actually controlled by the engineers, the concrete, or the dirt, or the rock. So eight people were killed in this flood and the lower Ote Dam just completely blew out. Um, the water came up so high, it began to overtop the dam. And when that overflow reached 3,500 CFS, the dam started eroding and it was gone within five minutes. And that happened about 5.20 PM. The whole rock fill at the site was removed in the next 15 minutes and 40,000 acre feet of water was released and killing 30 people. That's actually more water than came out of the St. Francis Dam in uh, 1928 that we're gonna talk about shortly. So there was another dam safety act. I mean, you gotta do something, right? Uh, so the uh, public outcry was quite, was quite loud about these failures down in San Diego County. So now the state engineers granted authority over all dams 10 feet high or which impound more than nine acre feet, which is 3 million gallons, but they had exceptions. Exceptions for dams, for mining debris constructed by the California Debris Commission, operated by the Army Corps of Engineers, mostly up in the Sacramento Valley and Sierra foothills. Dams constructed by municipal corporations maintaining their own engineering departments, like the LA Department of Water and Power, and dams and reservoirs that were part of water systems regulated by the state's new Public Utilities Act. So those are the exceptions. They didn't get reviewed. They weren't required to have review. 
The State Railroad Commission was given authority over all dams owned by public utilities beginning in 1917. These are the dams that were built for making hydroelectric power because there was this electrification of America that really took off in the 1920s. The commission exercised oversight on 46 of the 140 dams built in California between 1917, World War I, and the crash, the stock market, 1929. Municipal agencies such as East Bay Municipal Utility District, LA County Flood Control District were exempt from state overview until August 1929. Um, so what occurred during this period? A lot. There was a, actually dam engineering underwent a very rapid metamorphosis during this time frame. And part of that was because earth moving equipment was being rapidly developed because of the demand for irrigation and for paved roads. That was the driving factors. And so um, the State Railroad Commission started looking at these things. The Federal Power Commission, established in 1920, started looking at all the projects that generated electrical power using water. And so you had more jurisdictional agencies uh, on the scene looking at things. Sweetwater Dam had its capacity enlarged for a third time in 1919. And this one was very, very interesting. Now the spillway capacity, which originally was around 1,200 CFS, they've hiked it up to 45,000 CFS. And the only way they can do that is by rebuilding this right abutment completely with mass concrete and using a siphon spillway, the only one of its type in California that I'm aware of. And so when the water got up here and the siphons triggered, this thing could really push the water out very, very rapidly. And they haven't had any severe safety incidents with this dam since this third revision. There's what it looks like today. There's a re-regulating um, drop wall, a buffer wall there to meter out the flow going downstream. But there's those siphon spillways on either side, which are very unique. And then the uh, emergency overflow weir across the entire dam here in case these get overwhelmed. And um, it stores 27,690 acre feet of water uh, for the California American Water Company. Well, the highest buttress dam in the world uh, was built at Lake Hodges, also by John Eastwood. Um, this is 136 feet high when it was completed in 1918. Um, it's a very elegant dam uh, it, and it had, it developed cracks that were in the direction of the principal stresses on the dam. And it actually, um, in, it was instrumented and studied um, along with Rodriguez Dam in Tijuana by Fred Notesley, Hubert Woods and Roy Carlson in 1929. And it was overtopped in 1927 passing 45,000 cubic feet per second of water. This is actually showing the overpour and it survived that without any ill, really ill effects. I mean, there was a lot of erosion downstream, obviously, the event that size, because a lot of the channels down in San Diego County coming off the Southern California batholith are all uh, heavily sand channels, so they erode like crazy, because sand doesn't have any cohesion. There's no glue to it. It's very, very erodible material. Um, Gem Lake Dam on the east side of the Sierra was uh, built for hydroelectric power. It's, it, again, it's a multiple arch buttress dam. Um, they didn't think before they built these, the ones at 9,000 feet, that's Gem Lake. Agnew is at 8,500 feet and about 112 feet high. And the cylinders are about 84 feet across. They're half hemispheres. And it wasn't very long before they started seeing deterioration of these. And this has to do with frost heave um, because concrete's not as impermeable as everybody assumed it was. It took us quite a few years to figure that out, but they brought in Raymond Davis from Cal Berkeley, who was a great expert on concrete. And uh, he found that they had used a low lower water cement ratio um, in the concrete on the buttresses, which are the walls in between these uh, hoops you see here. 
And um, that led to the American Concrete Institute recommending water cement ratios of no more than 0.45 for poured concrete, which is in the ACI 318 code to this day and is a national and world standard. So these, both these failures played into that development of that standard. This is Lake Spalding Dam, which is up near Donner Pass, and it was begun in 1912 as a gravity dam on the south fork of the Yuba by Pacific Gas and Electric. And they decided in 1913 to switch to a variable radius design, so that's why you have this big step in the dam right here. You go from having a conventional gravity dam to a much thinner, and this is a um, variable radius dam and uh, Lars Jorgensen designed this. And the first one's at Salmon Creek, Alaska, um, built for power as well up near Juneau. This dam reached 225 feet in 1914. It was raised 35 more feet in 1916 and another 15 feet in 1920. And when they finally topped it out, it was 276 feet high, which was a world record in 1920 for highest dam in the world. Still in the PG&E system. Um, first arch dam with an artificial thrust block was Gibraltar Dam, built on the San Inez River on the backside of the San Inez Mountains. This is for water supply for uh, Santa Barbara. Goes through the Tecolote Tunnel, which is about nine, four miles long. Goes underneath the mountains and uh, they used a 3,000 cubic yard thrust block over here on the right abutment adjacent to their spillway structure because they wanted to maximize the storage volume in this lake, not stop it down here. So this artificial thrust block becomes a way, it's all about economizing on the volume of concrete. So you're going with mass concrete, but you figure you're in the bedrock here, they didn't think this was gonna be a real big deal. And then they had a big earthquake in Santa Barbara in June, 1925. And they have since uh, retrofitted this whole structure with Rollcrete Dam built in front of it and against it. That was back about 25 years ago. Um, hydraulic fill technology started to come on very strong uh, in the early 1900s. This is actually Highway, which is on the uh, Los Angeles Aqueduct. It's uh, between Owens Valley and um, the Garlock Fault. It's the largest structure they have back up in there. A, and they, they did here is they were able to get enough water out of the lower Owens River to bring trains in, dump material, and have this puddled pool where the silt and clay would settle out, and that would become your impermeable core or your barrier, seen over here in the drawing on the right. And so all the embankment dams between 1900 and 1940 pretty much were built this way because it was considered the easiest way to get a dam that had zone fills. So you had pervious shoulders, which were stronger, and then holding up this weaker core, but the core is impervious. All of that changed in September 1938 when they had a massive liquefaction failure of the upstream shell of Fort Peck Dam up in Montana. And the Army Corps of Engineers brought in all sorts of expertise to try and learn what had happened there. And, uh, and it was a liquefaction failure of a sand unit between two volcanic ash units that were impermeable. And that made everyone so nervous about the geologic nuances that they uh, basically said no more hydraulic fills, there's too many unknowns with um, embedded pore pressures, depending on how fast you bring them up. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about Lafayette Dam, 1928. Um, so here's another puddled core. This is for an East Bay um, water company, which became part of East Bay Mud later. This is San Pablo Dam. And uh, this is showing the core pool for San Pablo Dam in 1919. When it's being built, they're using hydraulic monitors to jet off these uh, tertiary sediments over here and bring them down. And then from the side where the picture's taken, they bring the jetting these sediments down these troughs. And then 
washing them in there. It's just like giant hydraulic mining operation, basically. So the trestles are to carry the fluidized material down here. And then the, big, the bigger stuff, the rocks and the walnut size stuff stays out here. And the fine grain stuff goes into the core pool. When this was completed, it was the highest embankment dam in the continental United States. It was 2.22 million cubic yards of material built without a bulldozer or without a scraper. Pretty, pretty hard to imagine. All you needed was lots of carpenters to make those troughs and those trestles and some hydraulic monitors to sluice down the fine grain material. Calaveras Dam was of similar design, but met with a much different and uh, more odious end. Um, it had a huge liquefaction slide of the upstream shell when it was about 95% complete in 1918. It was intended to be 240 feet high. It would have been the largest earth fill dam in the world in 1918 when the failure occurred. This is the day before the failure. That's the day after the failure right there. This is the upstream shell coming, liquefying and flowing into the um, reservoir, taking down the intake tower. And that was 800,000 cubic yards of material. And they were out there for five years studying and revamping all this and reworking it to fix it. And they didn't complete the new structure till 1925. And they just replaced it here in the last decade. Um, here's what it looked like. This is what the original dam looked like. It was a hydraulic fill. Here's where the failure surface was. The liquefaction occurred down in here, this area. There's the tower that got, intake tower that got taken out. There's what the slide looked like in two, uh, in, in the original slide, 1918. And then here's how they rebuilt it in 1923 to 25. And this has all been superseded now by a, a less composite structure and a very modern structure with a lot of over excavation on the abutments. This is uh, owned by City of San Francisco um, for the Hetchy system. Sheffield Dam in 1925 was the first earthquake induced liquefaction failure. And it was actually very bouldery type of uh, material that liquefied in the earthquake. This is June 28, 1925, was a mag 6.3 quake. And uh, it didn't trigger anything special. It wasn't really recognized or, or able to be evaluated till the late 1960s by Harry Seed and uh, cohorts at, at Cal Berkeley when they started working heavily on liquefaction failures, starting with the 64 earthquake in uh, Anchorage. And this was uh, certainly one they did a lot of work on to look at. It is a very unique geology at the site. And it, it um, opened up like a door. You can see here, it didn't liquefy much here. It opened like a door. So this all comes back down here and it just swung open like that. Uh, the reservoir's been drained and abandoned for some time now, about 10, more than 10 years. Chatsworth Reservoir was an, one that was damaged by an earthquake in August 1930. It's at the extreme southwest end corner, lower corner of uh, San Fernando Valley. And there was a 5.2 earthquake in the Santa Monica Bay, about uh, eight, nine miles away in August 1930. And that shaking caused so much dynamically induced consolidation and cracking that the city never got this thing filled up to design capacity ever again. It went through another series of evaluations in the 1960s. And with the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, and this being a hydraulic fill, it got abandoned by LA Department of Water and Power. It just it was gonna cost too much to maintain it. It leaked more than any other reservoir they had uh, in their system. Um, and it had some algae plumes and other problems. First dam built with, um, with mechanical scrapers uh, was Philbrook Dam, built by Kaiser Construction for PG&E in 1926. West Branch of the Feather River. And this is actually Bob Letourneau, R.G. Letourneau, who designed these scrapers. And Henry Kaiser saw how fantastic they were for earth moving. 
uh, when he was building Crow Canyon Road, uh, when he saw Laterno building Crow Canyon Road. So they partnered and Kaiser bought the um, patent on these scrapers because Bechtel and Kaiser were originally in the dirt moving business for building roads. And they started doing these earthen dams for PG&E just as a sideline for hydroelectric power. This is the first dam built on a fault, knowingly built on a fault, 1928 Stony Gorge Dam. It's west of Willows up in the West Sacramento Valley. And you can see the, the red there is a fault that they detected going underneath the dam. They decided to use a flat buttress structure with 18 foot wide cells and the fault goes underneath the edge of the spillway, which um, in this case, you can't see the fault. It's off to the right of the picture there. But this is an Amberson Dam Company that built this. They had this system patented. They tried to build a lot of them. And the basis was, again, yeah, they're trying to minimize the amount of concrete because the cement powder is expensive. This is not a dam, technically not in California, but it was designed and built by Californians for uh, Mexico. It's just across the border and near Tijuana. It's the wa municipal water supply for Tijuana. It was built uh, there in 1930. It's much higher than the, um, most of the buttress fills in the United States. It's, about the, it's um, about the same height as Hodges, 240 feet high, but much longer. And then these are the spillway control chutes right here. And they encountered a, a, a very serious fault zone underneath this one. And so they ended up building this uh, arch structure to arch these thrust over that active fault zone and this poor foundation material right here. It's very ingenious for the time. Fred Notesley and several other people of note worked on it. Um, and and it's, it's soldiered on very well considering where it's, where it's located. Um, Coyote Dam, is one that was in the news lately. It's gonna be uh, drained and retrofitted and shut down. It was the first embankment dam knowingly built over a active fault trace. That's the 1,000 foot wide fault trace of the Calaveras Fault down near Morgan Hill. And so that dam was completed in the mid 1930s, 1936 for the Santa Clara Valley Water District. And it's going into retrofit uh, as we speak here. Um, Stevenson Creek Test Dam is, is one that hardly anybody has ever heard of. It is one of the most important um, civil engineering scale model tests ever done. Uh, it was to test the whole idea of arch and cantilever action um, to, to, to develop the trial load method of analysis. In the spring of 1926, the Engineering Foundation decided to build this structure. And it's in the, up in the Sierras. They built it on a very steep creek, Stevenson Creek. So if it failed, it was 60 feet high and two feet wide at the top. And they were gonna hopefully load it all the way up and they instrumented it so they could see, you can see the vertical cracks that developed in it. If it failed, it held so little water that they, um, well, you could see right there Here's the dam, 68 feet high. It doesn't hold very much water because the, the creek is just literally a waterfall coming down into it. So the whole idea was not to kill anybody if the thing failed. But they instrumented it and they got tremendous um, data out of it. Here it is actually overtopping right here. And they developed maximum arch stresses of 207 PSI at the crown and 879 pounds per square inch at the abutments on a two foot wide section. Wow. Um, these uh, show the dam surviving overtopping in November 1926. Really remarkable. And here are the deflections they measured, the bending moment they calculated, the shear stress at the same time, and then the reactions of all these things compositely put in there. You see the load per cubic foot of concrete. And uh, the trial load analysis method was developed out of this and accepted by the engineering profession beginning in 1929. So arch dams designed prior to 1929 just made a lot of assumptions 
they, uh, they didn't have the trial load method to use. After 1929, there was much more um, science behind the whole thing. And there was concrete testing at UC Berkeley for this project and one to 12 uh, ratio model studies by the Bureau of Reclamation that were carried out at the University of Colorado for this project. It was jointly funded by a number of agencies. Um, St. Francis Dam uh, was the worst civil engineering disaster of the 20th century in the United States. It was in Southern California. It occurred in San Francisco Canyon, um, about 35 miles north of downtown Los Angeles. It was built between 1924 and 1926 as a, um, as a mass concrete dam with a, a pretty typical section like you would expect out of any textbook of the pre-1924 era. And um, it was originally envisioned as a curved concrete gravity dam. So it had an arch, 500 foot radius arch, 185 feet high. And the reason was because there was not any clayey material to build an embankment dam here. William Mulholland, who was the agency's chief engineer, had lots of experience with hydraulic fill and earth fill dams. Uh, he'd only done one concrete dam prior to this one, and it was its sister structure. They were very similar height and everything, and that was Weed Canyon Dam across from the Hollywood Bowl in Cahuenga Pass, and it was renamed Mulholland Dam when it was christened and completed 1925, and Lake Hollywood Reservoir is behind Mulholland Dam. It's still there, actually. Um, here's William Mulholland right here. Like um, O'Shaughnessy, he was an immigrant from um, Ireland. Well, he came from Belfast, Ireland. Uh, went to make his way in the world when he was 14, and largely he was self-taught. But he did appreciate geology. They, his Achilles heel, in my opinion, was he was very tight-fisted, and he didn't hire consultants. He thought he could, uh, everything's in books, go check the books out from the library, look in the books, and there you'll get your, your answers. You don't need to bring in a bunch of guys that you pay lots of money to. And so um, he promised the, uh, the, the board that controlled the waterworks in 1922, they were having a wa acute water shortage, and they built a whole series of new reservoirs and dams, and they heightened a lot of the existing ones because the Los Angeles aqueduct, uh, the Los Angeles was exploding with growth after World War I, and it was very dry, extra dry years. And so what he did, he promised them that this would be his biggest uh, addition, and he wanted this reservoir and this dam to store a one-year supply for uh, Los Angeles. And when he started the dam, that supply demand was about 30,000 acre feet a year. Then it went up to 32 and then to 34 and finally 38,000 uh, acre feet per year uh, was the consumption and so he kept adding to the height of the dam two times while they were building it without increasing the base width he increased the height and so he increased the height by 11 percent uh, in the end. Um, when it broke on the night of March 12, 13, uh, 1928, right around midnight, the dam had just topped out for the first time. It was two years old. It had topped out right to the spillway slits uh, just six days before the failure. And uh, the flood wave coming down here, you can see the grass right there, still in place. Flood wave was about 140 feet high out of the 205 feet depth and it killed at least 431 people of which 179 were never recovered. There were 13 different panels that investigated this failure. It was a, a who's who of everybody in the dam uh, building and design business and most of them blamed the failure on hydraulic piping along this ancient fault between this gray rock right here, the Polona schist, and uh, this is the Vasquez conglomerate over here, uh, the reddish colored stuff. And the reason was they would take a, a cup full of this stuff and put it into water and it would spontaneously disintegrate when it was in water. And so that's how all the focus came to be on the right abutment 
and not on the big landslide on the left abutment. The city ended up paying $14 million in restitution to victims, families who were killed in this event. Um, and that was all adjudicated by a uh, committee of 14 people, seven from Los Angeles County and seven from Ventura County, who actually arbitrated the whole thing and decided you were not allowed to use an attorney. Um, so they wouldn't have a bunch of ambulance chasing attorneys. Imagine that concept today. Um, cantilever action. Uh, most gravity dams are designed to resist bending this direction uh, in, it's called cantilever action. And down here, you can't allow the upstream heel to get into tension. If this bends too much and that opens up right there, then full reservoir hydraulic pressure will go underneath the dam and take the resultant thrust out of the middle third and shift it way downstream. So that's something they knew you had to look at. And there were no um, engineering calculations of any kind on this dam ever forthcoming that were ever shown um, to anybody. Uh, what we do know is that when we looked over here afterwards at block number one, there was a huge crack in the block near the right abutment and the gauge attendance ladder was crushed and inside that crack, which means it had to have opened like I've drawn it right here. And this opened even three feet as it easily looks that it did. Uh, that would shift the resultant thrust from the middle third of the dam, which is what you need to have for stability, 435 feet downstream, ouch. So this actually, this dam becomes very unstable and overturning when the reservoir got within five feet of the spillway crest. Um, arching loads, the arching loads um, get very high when you get within 11 feet of crest. They didn't calculate those or consider them. They felt that if they put the arch in it, that was adding to the safety factor, which is true. It was, they didn't have the ability to calculate the arch loads when this was designed in 1922 to 1924. Um, there was an enormous landslide on the left abutment. Only a one quarter of that slide mass had the reservoir against it. And the weight of this landslide was about 1.52 million tons. And the dam's the amount of concrete in the dam was 271,000 tons. So the schist actually took the whole left side of the dam and slid it across the canyon. And so this actually shows the four open cracks. Mulholland was very concerned about water coming through these shrinkage cracks. So he had those cracks chinked with oakum to prevent the leakage. That was a huge mistake. He did that, the chinking is shown here with oakum. That was so he could come in here and grout and close up the cracks with the grout. And when you do that, the problem is, if it's still open back here, you're gonna have full reservoir pressure coming into the interior of the dam, and then that pour pressure can't get out now because of the oakum, and so the internal pour pressure is going to rise dramatically. So all this work got done within eight weeks of the failure. The eight weeks providing, preceding the failure is when this corrective work was done because of the leakage. And so if you take it to where it probably looked like at the time of failure, the uh, hydrostatic uplift pressure inside this thing was really huge. And that's why you got these big, huge cracks, 200 plus feet high, uh, separating the blocks. Well, that uh, failure, it killed so many people. It got an enormous amount of attention. And so dam safety legislation of August 14th, 1929 was enacted and it was sweeping. It was without precedent anywhere uh, in the world. And so California became one of the safest places supposedly to, uh, to build dams. Well, that legislation wasn't even a year old when it got tested. And it was in uh, LA County Flood Control District was building the largest dam in the world by a 
by 10 times the size of St. Francis, was going to be the highest dam in the world, and it was going to be the largest volume dam in the world. 512 feet high, 3.8 million cubic yards. Where? In San Gabriel Canyon above Azusa. That's where it was going to be, and they started working on it. And uh, they spent a couple, three million dollars excavating the right abutment. And as they did more and more excavating, they lost more and more material. They were excavating about 100,000 cubic yards per month in 1928. This was within six months of the St. Francis collapse. And on June 26, 1929, this is about a year and three months after the St. Francis collapse, they did a detonation in coyote tunnels on the right abutment and the whole mountain came down, basically. They detonated 193,000 pounds of, of dynamite and um, they brought down 160,000 uh, cubic yards of rock. And then they had another massive landslide that moved 200,000 yards of rock the following September 16th. That's when they were shut down. And the state came in, they uh, uh, appointed a panel of experts which included Jack Savage, the chief engineer, design engineer of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who did Shasta, Friant, Glen Canyon, or not Glen Canyon, uh, Hoover Dam, and um, Grand Coulee, and George Elliott of San Francisco, George Lauterbach, professor at Berkeley, mining geology, and Ira Williams and Charles Berkey. Charles Berkey was a geology professor who uh, at uh, Columbia University and a relative of mine. On November 26th, the panel issued a report stating that the proposed dam cannot be constructed without creating a menace to life and property. And so they killed the project. And LA County Fleck and Drill District subsequently built a record height rock fill dam downstream a few years later. Um, it's also the first project that sent an elected official to jail. A grand jury was appointed in February 1930 to investigate the validity of all the claims. The contractor filed a lawsuit to recover damages for breach of contract, claiming that 773,000 cubic yards have been excavated. He was paid an additional $831,000 at $295 per cubic yard, but in the summer of 1933, Former LA County Supervisor Sidney Graves was found guilty of accepting an $80,000 bribe from that contractor to hasten the board's approval of the claims. And that contractor left the state of California, they were based in San Francisco, relocated to Las Vegas, and were one of the six companies that went on to build Hoover Dam um, a few years later. World's highest dam in 1929, LA County Flood Control District. It was Pacoima Dam, Constant Angle Arch Dam, 372 feet high. The only notable thing about Pacoima, it's never held a whole lot of water because the rock is so fractured, it's frightening. <laughs> but it was the first one to have strain meters in them that Roy Carlson invented. He was the inventor of the strain gauge and strain stress meters. And um, he was from uh, Redlands, California, educated at Redlands um, College in physics, and then a uh, master's degree in math at uh, Caltech. And it was when he's at Caltech that they recognized his genius for instrumentation. And we're gonna see him throughout our story uh, here in a lot of different projects, especially Shasta Dam. He was instrumental in the work on Hoover Dam working with um, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and with Cal Berkeley, with Raymond D. Davis. Well, 1929 to 31, the state with their newfound uh, responsibilities went out and looked at all the dams in the state. One third, only one third of them were deemed to be adequate safety, stability. One third were found to be in need of alterations, repair, changes, and another third needed more engineering examination. Um, around this same time, in July 1931, Bob Letourneau came from working on the highway between Boulder City and Hoover Dam, 
where he had lost $200,000. He came over here to Orange County to build this dam for the Orange County Flood Control District. Uh, this is Santiago Creek Dam or Lake Irvine. And here he used his Model A carryall scrapers. This is the last time he used solid drum steel wheels because he invented the use of pneumatic tires the next year down in the Imperial Valley. And he moved 400,000 cubic yards of fill his first month on the site using these Model A carryall scrapers. That was a game changer. And in World War II, this guy had seven plants worldwide building 75% of the earth moving equipment for all the allied forces. His largest factory actually being in Australia. Uh, he was incredible. He got his start working in the um, power plant in downtown San Francisco, uh, where he learned how to use direct current, direct drive, not using alternating current. And he was put out of a job by the San Francisco earthquake, burning down the building he worked in. Um, Mulholland Dam, which is uh, in uh, Cahuenga Pass, Weed Canyon, right off uh, the 101 freeway. You can see here's downtown Hollywood right here. There's Mulholland Dam, what it looked like in 1928. Same design as St. Francis Dam. So these people are not happy campers. They're all very, very nervous. They're all going to the mayor's office and the water supply board's office and the board, you know, all these different boards and they're testifying against this thing saying, hey, what are you doing? We got this similar design up here. Mr. Mulholland even says it's the same design. Um, we think you should look into this. And so it was the most studied and peer reviewed dam in America for many years. Maybe uh, Orville will break that now finally, but uh, th they had so many different reports done for so many years on this. And finally, what did they decide to do? They decided to retrofit it with a huge buttress that look you see right here in front of the concrete dam. There they are placing the buttress in 1933, 34. Then they're gonna plant it with all these trees and cover it up and make it go away. And they lowered the dam by two thirds. So two thirds of the volume of the original um, Hollywood Reservoir is not there behind the dam. They put this 330 cubic yards of rolled fill in in front of it. And then they planted all these trees just to leave the, the uh, arches at the top. And you can't even see those today. Here's an aerial picture of what it looks like today. So I call it the camouflaged Mulholland Dam. Well, Hydro compression is something that um, nobody thought too much about <laughs> until they, they started building these rock fill dams because they were inexpensive <laughs> up in the mountains. This is Cogswell, <coughs> excuse me, Cogswell, originally called San Gabriel Dam Number no. Two, was built above San Gabriel Dam Number no. One, where that one dam got canceled, I told you about. And this was in the 1930s, 32 to 35. And what happened is um, the dam sank five and a half feet when it first filled. And they had planking along the back of it. And that was because of hydro compression of the rock fill. This was um, retrofitted in the 1990s. Here's what the sediment influx, this, this uh, chocolate soup here is from the station fire in 2009 which was the largest fire in california history up to that point till the thomas fire a couple years ago so this one is still there but they had to remove 3.3 million cubic yards of sediment that had accumulated in it that's what it's there for is to catch the sediment and keep it from going into san gabriel reservoir downstream um, Earthwork equipment and techniques largely evolved out of California. The first sheep foot roller shown here in 1902, it was patented by the Petrolithic Paving Company. It was going to uh, pour asphalt in, onto adobe soil and then compact it real well to make it impervious to water so it wouldn't get uh, plasticky and mucky in the wet season. It didn't work, but they invented the sheep's foot roller 
and started using this to compact dams in the mid 1920s. This actually shows Henshaw Dam down in San Diego County. It was the first mechanically compacted dam or embankment dam with sheep's foot rollers. There's the rollers being pulled by, um, by mules. And here's the guy spraying water to get the water content at optimum water content, usually about 15% by weight. The first federal dam to be mechanically compacted was in 1929, Echo Dam, which is upstream of uh, Ogden, Utah, up in the Wasatch Mountains. Interstate 80 goes right by it today. Um, Bouquet Canyon Reservoir, about nine miles from um, St. Francis Reservoir site, was the replacement structure for St. Francis. And the city of LA knew that they had to do a world-class job on this one to get out of the doghouse that they were in on the St. Francis failure. So they really did pull out all the stops. They told their resident engineer, who had been the resident engineer on St. Francis, a guy named Ralph Proctor, they said, come up with a test that'll show the world we're doing the best job we can of moisture, soil moisture conditioning of the soil and compaction of these two huge embankments. And he developed the Proctor Compaction Test, which is used all over the world. You can go to China, you can go to uh, India, you can go to Russia. They all know what the Proctor Compaction Test is. They, they may not know who Walter Alston or Sandy Koufax are, but they know what the Proctor Compaction Test is. Um, the Proctor Test is good for contractors because it basically, in a few minutes, it lets the contractor know whether they need more dry material or they need more moist material. And so that, uh, this is a picture of Proctor right here, what he looked like at that, back at that time. He came up with this test and he published four articles in Engineering News Record 1933 that laid out the methodology for the test. And it was a very simple test, everybody could do it. When they were done with Bokeh Canyon, it was the most instrumented, earth dam in the world for a long time, till Orville came along actually in the 1960s. And uh, this is from a paper in the International Conference on Soil Mechanics and Foundation Engineering, which uh, Proctor had four articles in that conference, more than any other person. And he never finished his degree in civil engineering at USC, but he was a really good field engineer Here's what the dam looks like today. It was one of the LADWP's first structures to be equipped with strong motion accelerographs, both on the crest of the dam, you see right here, um, and at the base of the dam. So we get a free field one out here, we get one under the dam, and then we have one up on top of the dam. And then this is the West Saddle Dam over here. So this replaced the St. Francis structure. Um, more dam safety inspections in the 1930s. Um, one third of them were found to be in need of repairs. Funny how that works. New dam construction was all under state observance from August 29 forward, except for federal dams, federal agencies like the Bureau of Reclamation or the Corps of Engineers. O'Shaughnessy Dam is the kingpin structure for the San Francisco Municipal Water System, which uh, was worked on between 1912 and 1940, it was a long, long, expensive project. And they didn't have the funds to build it out to where they wanted it to be in the um, little Grand Canyon of the Yosemite. The, um, and so they actually uh, built it, this darker gray part was built first in 1919 to 1923. And then this addition in lighter gray was put in in 19, 35 to 38. Now, when you do that, you're mixing two different kinds of concrete that are on two different uh, behavior paths. This one is still going to be hydrating uh, for a long time after this one's done hydrating. So they had to make a separation here between them and then come in and grout that at some later point once all the shrinkage had occurred through and all the heat of hydration had occurred in the structure. So this was a, this was some real serious 
uh, big time engineering to look at these kind of issues and to decide how you're gonna mate them. These are the reinforcing bars coming out of the old dam, going into the new dam all along here to try and pull it all in so that you have one cohesive monolith. So they're built 15 years apart. Um, this is O'Shaughnessy Dam. They named it after Michael O'Shaughnessy. This is what it looks like. And uh, this is the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park that got inundated. Um, this is the one that John Muir, toward the end of his life, fought so hard against and lost. It went all the way to the President of the United States and the Supreme Court. And Theodore Roosevelt uh, was a progressive, and he felt that this was the best thing for the people of California as a whole. We didn't have cars in those days. We didn't have easy ways for tourists to get up here and look at it. And um, so Muir lost that one. But what came out of it was the formation of the Sierra Club, which went on to become the mega giant of NGOs in the 1960s with the fight over uh, dams in the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. Um, Morris Dam was built in the uh, San Gabriel Canyon above Azusa, downstream of San Gabriel Dam in 1931 to 34. Uh, it's named after Samuel Brooks Morris, who was chief engineer of the Pasadena Water Department and later moved on to the, become the chief engineer of the LA Department of Water and Power in 1944. It was the first masonry dam in the world designed with fault offset. They had these two faults they encountered in the foundation. So they designed this baffle that could uh, accommodate up to six and a half feet of offset. And they built that into the dam, which was really something. That was a very, very novel scheme. Here is that earthquake joint today. And you can see the movement that they've had on it here is about three inches going across the dam. It's never posed any problem for the operation or the safety of the dam. Actually, it is a concrete dam. It's not going to be subject to hydraulic piping or something like that. I guess oops, I measured it. It was 2.5 inches. I'm sorry. It was, Morris Dam was the first dam to have its hydraulic properties, oh, I got a type up there, have its hydro, dynamic properties evaluated. And the guy that did that was a young Stanford graduate, his first job out of, out of Stanford, 1934 uh, was with the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, and he went out there and put a dynamic exciter on the top of the dam, and he was able to measure the fundamental period of vibration of the dam, which is what you need in order to do any sort of dynamic analysis on the dam. This dam was designed, was the first dam designed with a pseudo-static coefficient for earthquake loading because of those faults. And they designed it for 0.1 G, one-tenth of gravity. And that's gonna be real important, you're gonna see here uh, in the future of this dam because it had that extra strength put into it so that when World War II started and we found out our torpedoes were not working properly, um, the Naval Ordnance Testing Station at Morris Dam Testing Facility was established through Caltech scientists in nearby Pasadena. They wanted a place where they could go up and launch uh, torpedoes and other warheads into the water. And so if they exploded in the water, they wouldn't damage the dam. This dam was designed for that kind of extra loading. So all of a sudden, from 1943 to 1993, the Navy was parked there. And I remember growing up in West Covina in the 1950s and hearing the explosions up there in this place. They would close the road for a whole day, uh, San Gabriel Canyon Road, and, and you'd hear these boom explosions. And years later, when I was a Naval officer and I was an intelligence officer, I got to get into the files and look at stuff. And, and I found the first uh, Poseidon missile launch was done out of this lake there, right? close couple miles from where I grew up. I never dreamed they were doing stuff like that up there. This is the variable angle launcher, which is on the HAER now. It's a historic American research record. It was a very unique structure. Um, anyway, it was chosen because it had good security and the dam was designed for extra dynamic loading. 
San Gabriel Dam upstream of that was completed a few years later as the highest rock fill dam in the world. It um, had 10.57 million cubic yards of rock and it was 355 feet high. And this is a three to one side slope, which is the flattest slide slope for a rock fill dam for many, many decades. The big problem was compacting rock. I mean, it's pre-Cambrian pre metamorphic rock. That's all you have up there. How are you going to compact that kind of stuff? They tried three different things here. They tried spiked rollers with replaceable hammerheads. They tried a corundum tipped spikes to try and break the material up. And they tried grid rollers to break the material up and add water, about 10% moisture. Paul Bauman came up with these. He was the assistant chief engineer of the LA County Flood Control District. Later, he worked for Dames and Moore. When I was at Dames and Moore, he was actually a consultant to them on all their dams work. Uh, he was um, a native of Austria, as I remember, as I recall. A really, really neat guy. Um, when that project was being built during the Great Depression, <laughs> they. Uh, they just got the dam built and they just got the spillway put in, but it wasn't paved. Here's the spillway, it's a pour over spillway. The dam's off to the right here. Uh, they had a 24 hour disastrous uh, flood in March 2nd, 1938. And you can see here the peak flow that came out of the, this, the spillway, which was only five days old was 57,150 cubic feet per second. The, the inflow coming into the reservoir was almost 100,000 CFS. That deposited 8.3 million cubic yards of sediment in 36 hours, which was a record at that time. They haven't had any floods go over that spillway since that night. So they're already at 80 years and counting. Um, what are the chances of that? You put this thing in five days after you complete the cut, it has a record event go over it, and then none, none since. Um, Imperial Dam and desilting Wurtz is uh, upstream of Yuma on the California-Arizona line, F 17 miles above it. It's a very important structure where you try to take as much of the silt out of the river because the Colorado River is the fifth largest silt carrier in the world, of any river in the world. And this dam is a very um, unusual dam. It was part of the um, Boulder Canyon project, actually. They put it in in 1938. And this area is still all unconsolidated sediment and it's, it's settling. So you're, gonna, you're putting a dam on a foundation that's settling. So they battered precast pre concrete piles and they battered those. And then they, put, they designed the dam as a floating structure with rubber seals between all the bays. The bays are 50 feet apart. So it was the first masonry dam built on piles. Another, another first for California. Uh, as part of that same project, but upstream um, is Parker Dam, which has the deepest dam foundation in the world when it was completed in 1938. A lot of the same people built this one that built uh, Hoover Dam. It's two dams down from Hoover. And it was paid for by the uh, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. It, and so that was for the intake right here for their um, Colorado River Aqueduct, which is the big aqueduct in Southern California. It services 17 million people. They had to over excavate this 235 feet down to get to bedrock. So uh, up here, the, the dam is only 85 feet high but there's the structure itself is 320 feet high. It's mostly buried in water. So very conservative structure built on a, a radius. First arch dam with twin thrust blocks just before World War II for Camp San Luis Obispo for the Army. California had the 40th Division there, part of their National Guard. And uh, they had a thrust block right here, a thrust block there. It's now called Salinas Dam in Lake Santa Margarita. It's uh, for the water supply for uh, Salinas area, but uh, there's the dam 
what it looked like. And again, that was all about saving money using less concrete to put that in. Um, the first fully instrumented dam in the world was Shasta Dam. Um, and it had instruments that they would have liked to have put in Hoover Dam, but they didn't have them at that time. This is for, like for things for measuring the um, concrete heat of hydration with thermocouples, things like that. And so um, this is the largest mass concrete dam in California. It's 6.3 million cubic yards of concrete. And it has the largest reservoir of any uh, lake in California that's man-made, uh, total capacity of 4.55 million acre feet. And um, this is actually showing a maximum section through the dam. These are actually showing the uh, progression of the placement of mass concrete here where it was on New Year's Day, 1943, New Year's Day, 1944, and it was finished in 1944. Powerhouse came online, the first unit online in 1945. And they used Carlson's strain gauges, stress meters, and temperature meters in this project. And this became, um, a very, very well-known project because Jerry Rayfield, the guy you just saw putting those pressure meters, he went on to join the faculty in civil engineering at Berkeley in 1953. And he got the ASF, ASCE MOSIF award in 1954 for his paper describing stresses in Shasta Dam. He was my mentor in all this dam history stuff that you're hearing <laughs> because I was a geotechnical engineer, geological engineer, He's a structural guy. He talked me into minoring in structures so I could talk to structural engineers intelligently, quote unquote. And um, he, um, I was sent to go work with him because I started doing my research on the Teton Dam failure, 1976. And Professor Seed felt that I should go learn about dam engineering from Professor Rayfield because he was a recognized world expert. Rayfield and Ray Clough were both structural engineers, were the guys who invented the finite element method of analyzing structures right around 1960, after they had the Oroville Dam model contract, 1958-59. And so this played a big role in that because they had this data to work back towards to confirm that finite element was giving them the right answers. It was really, really important with developing the finite element method. Um, Matillaha Dam, uh, designed by the Donald R. Warren Company of Los Angeles, 1946. He was a Caltech graduate. He didn't graduate from Caltech until he was about 40, but Donald Warren had his finger in so many different pies. He also designed the uh, Kaiser Fontana steel plant during World War II. This was a little project for them after the war for the local um, uh, uh, irrigation district up near Ojai in Ventura County and the dam was 190 feet high it was a constant angle arch dam they built and they recognized when they were building it that they needed to get the aggregate from Irwindale 100 miles away because the local aggregate had opalin quartz in it which causes alkali aggregate reaction when they got to this part of the dam right about there the sand part was not from Irwindale. It came from a local source near Ojai, actually along the Santa Clara River, which had the opalin quartz in it. That wasn't caught at the time, and it had ter it suffered terrible alkali aggregate reaction, where the aggregate causes the cement reacts with the cement paste, and it it, uh, it swells, and it causes all this internal cracking. This was first discovered when they were building Parker Dam back in the late 30s over on the Colorado River. And so this project's always been a problem child. Within the first 20 years, the whole reservoir silted up. That's how fast the Santa Inez Mountains are going up. Their um, rate of tectonic uplift is close to that of the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush, as much uh, anywhere from nine to 22 millimeters per year. This is sediment filling in. So the whole thing got sedimented in. They started cutting out and lowering the dam by 40 feet in the 1960s. And it's, um, sorry, it's slated for removal right now, has been for 20 years. 
they just can't decide who's going to pay for the removal because moving six million yards of goo and putting it up these side canyons is going to cost a lot of money. Uh, it does block the steelhead uh, migration upstream right now on the Buena Ventura River. Drum After Bay was a uh, dam right here, constructed in 1924 on the Bear River up near Donner Pass. It exhibited alkali aggregate reaction through the interaction of pyrite and the schist, and the new dam replaced it right here in uh, 1966. So there are other dams that have suffered with that. The first doubly curved thin arch dam in America was Monticello Dam. Um, Lake Berryessa stored behind it. It also has the largest uh, glory hole spillway in the United States, right here, which they have a lot of neat YouTube videos of. You want to see how it works. This dam was 304 feet high, only 100 foot thick at the base. And it was designed in the early 50s and completed in 1957. And it's uh, near the San Francisco Bay area, north of. Um, Fairfield and Vacaville. Uh, Mammoth Pool Dam was built by Southern Cal Edison on the upper San Joaquin River in the Sierras, south of Yosemite. Uh, it had sheet joints in it. The sheet joints gave them all sorts of problems in terms of they kept excavating them and they kept popping off again. And the rock here is the strongest rock ever tested in the United States. It has a compressive strength of about 37,000 PSI, which is about 10 times what good structural concrete is, 4,000 PSI concrete. Uh, that's the Mount Gibbons granodire. It's very, very brittle stuff. And Carl Terzaghi, the father of soil mechanics, this is one of his last consulting projects. He was brought in on this because they kept having these sheets that would exfoliate and come falling down on the workers. And it really created uh, a terrible problem that they didn't anticipate during design. Terzaghi came out there and, and he just has so much you know, practical experience and engineering judgment. He wisely tells them, just take the loose stuff off of here and put your, uh, put your earth fill over this thing. And uh, when you get done and you get this thing up here to its design height, you're gonna drill through that and you're gonna grout any openings you find down here, but after you put the load on it, you wanna put the effective stress on the rock before you grout it, you'll have a much better result. And that's what they did and that worked. But you can see the arcuate shape of a tensile pullout here, big huge slab came down and crashed all the way across the downstream shell of the dam. It was a fun project to uh, research and talk to people who had worked on it when I was younger. They're all, all virtually gone now. Project was completed in 1960. It didn't spill till just a couple of years ago, first time. I think it was 2011 or something like that that it actually spilled. Baldwin Hills Reservoir. I was nine years old when this one failed. It was on live on television on KTLA Channel 5 on Saturday, December 14th, 1963. It was an offline reservoir in the top of the Baldwin Hills, not too far, um, very close to Wilshire's Miracle Mile on Wilshire Boulevard up here. This is Cloverdale Avenue right here, which goes right up to Wilshire Boulevard. And uh, this is La Cienega, which you take over the hills to go down to LA International Airport. Uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, this thing was graded in the late uh, 40s, early 50s. It was completed in 1954. The uh, engineer of record was Ralph R. Proctor. It was his last project before he retired from the agency in 1956. Um, they went out there and saw that it was a problem and they uh, were not, they only had five hours or four hours between when they first noticed the problem and the problem got out of control. Here's a little movie. Shortly after the evacuation began, camera crews from TV station KTLA arrived at the reservoir and began to broadcast live aerial pictures of a disaster in the making. And right here now, as we come up over the Baldwin Hills Hills Reservoir, we can see the main break in the reservoir itself. The reservoir. 
While workers desperately tried to repair the breach, water began to flood the streets below. As the LAPD continued to evacuate the valley, the leak in the dam's face became a car. There goes a large chunk of the inner cement here in the following hills reservoir. That hole is 50 feet across. For the first time in American history, aerial pictures of a disaster were being broadcast live on television. At 3.38 p.m., just four hours after the first sign of trouble, the Baldwin Hill Dam gave way. All right, we'll stop it right there because I'm running a little bit late on time here. Um, bottom line was there was a fault right here, part of a flower structure associated with the Inglewood Fault, the Newport Inglewood Fault, the one that had had the Long Beach earthquake in April 1933. There's where the fault was. They had instrumented this. They had a faithful recording of 15 inches, 12 inches of vertical offset, 15 total inches of movement over a nine year period. But nobody did anything with the information. Here are the two stringers right here. The main fault in cross section right here. Here's the Inglewood, main Inglewood fault. And the one going through the reservoirs right here. Uh, all these faults create are called a flower structure. They look like a flower coming off the main fault down here, and they make wonderful oil traps, and that's why there was so much uh, subsidence in the area from the withdrawal of the oil. Today, there's no way the oil companies <laughs> who are drilling all these holes wouldn't have been paying for this um, disaster. But in 1963, they got away with it saying, oh, act of God. That's an enormous rate of movement, 15 inches, 12 inches in 10 years. Um, it was the beginning of reality television because it was pictured on their telecopter, which was usually only used five days a week to report the traffic. And we got to watch it all on television. Um, there was a Dam Safety Act after that that said, okay, State Division of Safety of Dams is now also uh, responsible for off-stream storage facilities Dams over 25 feet high, which impound more than 15 acre feet of water, and dams more than six feet high, which impound 50 feet acre feet. And the reason is because it's the, it's the water that does the damage. It's not the height of the dam. That's one thing, but it's the amount of water you store behind it that's going to kill people. Oroville, uh, California's mega project, part of their um, largest non-federal a public works project in American history, the California Water Project, ran continuously between 1956 and uh, 2011. And this was the kingpin structure of it on the, uh, beneath the three forks of the Feather River. It was the largest non-federal dam ever built in the United States. It um, had a, a coffer dam that was the largest coffer dam, highest coffer dam ever built. Uh, up to that point, and it withstood a uh, record flood just a few weeks after it was the coffer dam was put there. This actually shows um, what it looked like, the coffer dam looked like. It, the coffer dam was 400 feet high. The main dam was almost 800 feet high, 776 feet high. This is what the dam looked like. That's the coffer dam. Uh, when the flood actually occurred in December 64, and it caught the flood right here. The maximum discharge uh, from this was 157,000 CFS, way lower than the December 55 flood on the same river, which wiped out Yuba City. So this actually saved Yuba City, that copper dam at the time. This is the core block, the concrete of the main um, dam that hadn't even been started yet at the time of the flood. There's uh, what the highest dam in the world looked like in 1968 when the dedication ceremony with uh, Ronald Reagan and family was made in May 4th, 1968, but it was Pat Brown's project. And 
They had earthquake in the area that was uh, reservoir induced, they felt in 1975. This was a game changer in looking at everything differently in the Sierra foothills, especially the controversial Auburn Dam project, which would have been the largest free centered arch, thin arch dam in the world. And they found evidence of faulting, you know, 50 million years ago and some that was younger, but not crossing the dam itself, but it was enough to kill the project. These are some of the faults that were mapped in the foundation while it was under construction. This is in the late 1970s. And one person, Don Rose, who was a professional engineer and engineering geologist who worked in the tunneling industry, he actually ran finite element analyses of this in an earthquake and showed that it was overstressed. And that letter, which appeared in the Journal of Hydraulic Engineering, ASCE, was what triggered all of the additional studies that ended up killing the project. He was a vice president of Tudor Engineers in San Francisco at the time. The San Fernando earthquake, 1971, uh, all came within 15 inches of taking out lower Van Norman Dam. Uh, this would have killed 80,000 people if it had occurred some other month, because this was February uh, 9th and February 9th, the water was down very low. This is the downstream face of the dam. The whole upstream face was gone. I'm gonna keep going here. This is the cross section of it. This is the side that had the water on it. The blue section is the portion that was a hydraulic fill placed in 1911. That's what liquefied, turned to mush, and the whole upstream shell failed into the reservoir like you see here on the left, going in the other direction. So this is the crest of the dam, and you can see the, they lost uh, almost you know, 40 feet below that. And right here, that little tip, that green tip right there, is all that was between 80,000 people being killed in a massive flood and what didn't. That was, that was the closest we ever came to dodging a huge, huge, um, catastrophe, the likes of which would um, be known in every household today. Um, so lots of impacts of that earthquake on dam safety. They, they did dynamic analyses of 60 dams over the next decade. And dams became fewer and fewer. This is one of the last big ones, New Maloney's Dam, completed in uh, 1978. Um, uh, up in the Sierra foothills on the Stanislaus River. Um, San Luis Dam was part of the State Water Project, had an upstream shell failure in 1981 because they didn't remove all of the colluvium underneath the structure. And then they cycled water up and down in it seasonally for the water project. And so that lost its sheer strength. That was a huge amount of learning that occurred on that one. And now we're retrofitting a lot of these older dams, especially the concrete ones, for seismic loading, because we know so much more about how to do dynamic loading, uh, sophisticated assessments of strain, because strain is what's going to drive these things. And Diamond Valley was the largest off-stream reservoir in the world, where they built the downstream dam, and they built an upstream dam. So here's a valley. We don't have a valley big enough to put this much water in. This is a year's supply for Metropolitan Water District. So that's all of Los Angeles and San Diego and places in between. That was about $2 billion project. It was completed in December, 1999. Seven Oaks completed right about that same time. The last big dam in California, 550 feet high, 20 years of environmental studies and legal battles before they built this. This is right near Redlands. This is the uh, San Gorgonio Peak up here, the San Bernardino Mountains it's in Southern California. And Oroville. Uh, Oroville uh, first spilled on its service spillway in 1969. That's my picture, actually. And we had a submerged service spillway because it's a very flashy uh, watershed because it's all granite. So the water can come up real fast on you. We think stagnation pressure was the failure mechanism with uh, cavitation. 
between these joints because the service spillway was 3,000 feet long. If you just look at the um, half percent shrinkage, that's more than eight feet of gaps that should be in that spillway. And they patched them and patched them for years. Then they got into February 2017 and they started having problems. And what weathered was a saprolite. The material was like, like a clay consistency, even though it's supposed to be an umphiolite complex. And um, it just ripped all this stuff out and deposited it in the river and blocked the river, actually. This is the Feather River. And this, all this stuff that's brownish and red is the saprolite that should have been removed from this whole area uh, before they put the spillway down. It's amazing this thing survived the 250,000 cubic feet per second that it had running in it in uh, January 1995, 97 I mean, 97 it was just, this was all, I couldn't get any good pictures in 97, it was all in clouds of moisture. You couldn't see anything. Even in a mile and a half behind me in Oroville, you couldn't see anything. This is all this extra material, several million cubic yards of material that came down in February 2017 and blocked the river, heightened the tailwater on the powerhouse here by 17 feet. And so this had to come out first. There's about 150,000 cubic yards of rock. This is all the big stuff, the fine stuff's in the river. That's why the river's chocolate colored. It's taking the fines downstream. So they came in here, um, with self-compacting concrete, over-excavated and filled everything in and started over again. And that concludes our trip through <laughs> dams and disasters in California. I hope all of you hung on for the long haul. I'll be happy to answer any questions I can. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will start uh, fielding questions for you. And the first question that came from the Q&A box was, why, why were so many dams built on or near fault lines? Well, it's pretty hard to, avo uh, to avoid fault lines in California. You're, you're on the edge of a, tech, of a very active tectonic margin between the East Mexico rise and the Gorda plate. We have the San, the San Andreas transform. That plate is moving about 44 millimeters per year to the Northwest. So all of the rocks in the coast ranges of California, especially, are fractured up and faults are ubiquitous. They're about one every hundred meters you have a fault and there's fault systems. The San Andreas has only been the most active player along that margin in the last 200,000 years. Before that, it was the Hasgri San Gregorio and the Nascimento Fault, which were taking the bulk of the, the movement. So right now, the San Andreas takes about half of that tectonic movement, 22 millimeters a year, right lateral offset. Uh, it's just something you have, have to live with and you have to try and look at it. And we use probabilistic hazard assessment now to look at stuff like that. We don't use maximum credible earthquake. We look at all the different kinds of earthquakes that can affect a structure close in and from sources very far away. So like, um, a flexible structure like the Golden Gate Bridge, the most damaging quake to that bridge is not the 196 earthquake nine miles away. <laughs> no, it's the earthquake 200 kilometers to the north or 200 kilometers to the south, which come in as long period motion and get out of sync tilting of the towers. They call that, that's what you would worry about, like the, what brought the Tacoma Narrows Bridge down in 1940. So you have to look at all the different failure modes and all the different kinds of earthquakes now. And we call that probabilistic hazard assessment. And you look at the things that would be that your particular structure would be most vulnerable to. <clears throat> Great. Um, uh, we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to move through these as quickly as we can. But uh, <laughs> first uh, question is, um, do you know how, uh, I think this question meant to ask how many California uh, dams are for hydroelectric power versus domestic water supply? Well, all, most of the early ones that were high were for hydroelectric power. And, um, and that's after they, af that came after 
you know, 1911 when um, they first learned how to, they had a Westinghouse transformer and they could, you know, pump up the electricity and transport it, you know, more than 13, 14 miles away. That actually happened in uh, San Antonio Canyon below Mount Baldy. And there was a, uh, an old bedrock landslide that dammed the river and they built a tunnel through that landslide to a powerhouse and took the power down to Pomona, which I think was about 15 miles away. And that, that was a game changer because now you could make hydroelectric power up in the mountains where nobody lived and deliver it to the towns that were at least, you know, somewhat close by. And as the transporting capability improved dramatically through the 1920s, um, that's, that's when it was the heyday of hydroelectric power. It, it hasn't been since uh, World War II. So somebody wants to uh, know what you think about raising the, the Shasta Dam. Well, that's certainly something you got to think about with global warming because you need, you need more storage. Of course, the best place to store is in the groundwater, actually, if you could. There's people talking about, you know, the, the water in Northern Cal is in Northern California. It's not in Central or Southern California. And from the Bay Delta, south of the Mexican border, the coefficient of variation between wet and dry years is the greatest of any place in the world, in the world. The coefficient of variation, go Google it. Jay Lund, UC Davis, he's in the National Academy of Engineering. He gives the best speech I've seen on that. Um, and so what you do, you know, if you're a water resources engineer, you say, okay, well, I'm gonna take water from where the water is, which is Northern California, transport it to San Joaquin Valley and put it in the ground. Because if I put it in the ground and bring the water table back up 700 feet in Tulare County and Kern County and you know, Kings County, um, I'm not gonna lose as much of it to evaporation or evapotranspiration. Uh, evapotranspiration is where you have stuff growing in the water like algae and it takes, takes the water up. And then watercress is the worst one. You have to control the watercress. So you know, those are hard decisions you're gonna have to make. You know, people don't like dams, they change the ecosystem. That's true, they do. And they cause erosion downstream because you're letting clear water that's been desilted move downstream. That has more erosive capacity than, um, than dirty water has. So you, you have all these, they're all checks and balances. You just have to have, to have your, your eyes open and you have to have people at the table that are willing to have dialogue and make trade-offs on these things. So this is a question I was thinking about as you were presenting, um, and somebody was asking uh, what, uh, if you could tell us more about the future of these dams and other dams in California, and, and whether you think many will, will be retrofitted or decommissioned, and how do you balance those uh, environmental impacts that come with dams with the needs for flood control and electricity and drinking water and these other things? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually pretty concerned because I study failures and something we don't teach in school is about aging effects. We're gonna see failure modes like we saw it at, at, um, at Folsom in 1993. We had a tainter gate. Those were the highest radial gates in the world when they were built in 1954. 1994, they had one because of the vibration of the water going underneath it, which is very great the higher they are because of the pressure head. They had one fatigue and it failed and it failed catastrophically, and it emptied Folsom Reservoir. <laughs> and um, that was on nobody's radar horizon. It's just like the Oroville failure it wasn't on anybody's radar horizon till February 2017. And then the Corps of Engineers LA district says, okay, we got this new failure mode we got to look at. And as soon as they uh, you know, go down and start looking at some of their dams in Southern California, boom, it hits you. Hey, this dam discharges into a sand channel if they get, you know, a, a big overflow event like we saw at Oroville, it's just going to blow this channel out and it's going to undercut up and undo the spillway. And so uh, welcome to the most challenging things in the engineering world. They're all going to be aging and um, aging effects and new failure modes and environmental things that we because we again you got to watch those things for a long time to really know what the long-term uh, trade-offs are going to be uh, they're all things that demand multidisciplinary teams 
working together with each other. And they're, they're not so much theory as they are judgment. Uh, when you have big swings in weather patterns, that's a hard thing to handle, you know, it really is. We, what happened is we always had the groundwater to fall back on for the dry years. But if you go back and you look at the hydrography of the southern part of the state, two out of three years are below normal. So you operate in this deficit. We've been operating in a make-believe deficit on the Colorado River water and on the groundwater usage. And there's just not enough water unless you go to nuclear desal plants. That's probably where the future is if you want to have more people living there. I, I told that to the Arizona Assembly 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and the head of their water resources agency said, I've been telling them that for years, but they don't listen to me because I live here. <laughs> That's true. Um, so somebody is asking, and maybe, uh, you know, they wanted to finish up soon, so maybe they'll close with this question. Um, what would you say are the three principal takeaways for historians and for people who are non-engineers to understand and appreciate about dam construction and operation in California? History is gigantic. <laughs> History has so much to teach us. Uh, it's the single biggest problem I have when I sit in a room with other engineers. Uh, their solution to everything we bring up at the table when we're doing these every five years we review the safety of a plant that what the professors always come up with is this just instrument it put instruments in so you can write papers about it i said they had instruments at baldwin hills they had a beautiful record of it they had instruments at Bayonne dam in 1963 in the italian I mean, and he still killed five six thousand people i mean instruments aren't going to save a flawed design somebody who looks at the instrumentation and says time to stop time to do something that's that's what we need is people who um you know don't operate in a vacuum and and, and it, it came out at orville i mean i was critical of it that's why i'm not part of the state team you know i got i'm i'm on the blacklist because i pointed out to them so a lot of things that could have been done better you know so History is really important just to know because people have encountered similar problems before us. We should be aware of what they knew at that time and how did they go about handling it? How did they go about unraveling something? It's really important to understand. So when I was working under Professor Rayfield, here's what he told me. He says, well, you wanna, you wanna work in dams? I said, yes, I'm very fascinated by dams. I grew up in Southern California watching all these disasters. He says, well, if you want to work in dams, you should come down here this summer, go into engineering library, go to engineering news record, volume one, 1879, 77, and look in the yearly index and read every article on dams. And that's what I did for two summers. And that was a hell of a good education. I tell you, it really was. You can't read too much about your chosen field and the history and evolution of that field because it will humble you. <laughs> You'll see repeating things in the cycles. You'll see the same things said after the 196 earthquake that were ignored, that were also said after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and ignored again. You know, like this isn't gonna happen again in my lifetime. So, you know, let's move on. Let's not overreact to the disaster because it's not gonna happen again for a long, long time. I hear that all the time. Well, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, I uh, would like to ask you if it's okay if I shared the email address with our attendees. They have more questions. Sure. sure. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, for those of you who are interested in asking more questions, I'm uh, typing the email address into the chat box. And um, if you would like to leave uh, feedback for today's program, it should present you with a page to do that. But if not, I also pasted um, a web address to visit for you to leave evaluations for today's program. Uh, and thank you again for your time, Dr. Rogers, and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. And thank you all for joining today's program. I will encourage everybody before I leave to look uh, at our website about our annual conference coming up. As you know, the coronavirus has impacted a lot of live programs going on for multiple uh, nonprofits, but we will still be holding uh, a conference this year. It will just be entirely online. 
and uh, you can see and view the whole uh, program of events uh, on our website at californiapreservation.org slash conference. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.